remember going to the theater and I was scared to death. I said, oh, Jesus is going to kill me. And I watched E.T. and I was just sitting there saying, okay, this ain't that bad. You know, E.T. phone home. I remember coming, and me and Cece had an apartment together, and I remember coming in, and I said, Cece, you have to know Cece, we called her Lazaretha. She was so holy. She didn't just, like, rise up, Lazaretha. <laughs> Let you in on some secrets. That's what we did, and, and so I came home, and I said, Cece, you're not gonna believe. She said, oh, Jesus, what did you do? Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> I didn't kill nobody. Hold on. Hold on. I, I went to a movie. She said, oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. And so I called my mother. I said, because my father, it was his famous line. He would stand up in church. He would testify. I said, I, I didn't give my kids a nickel of a dime to go see no man moving. <laughs> so I called my mother. I said, Mama. I got my own nickels and dimes. And see, I love my mother, I love my mother, because I said, well, after I told her everything I did, she said, well, baby, I think she was making sure daddy went around. She said, ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs>
matter what day of the week it is, I am like the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Wherever you are this evening, come on, put your hands together and give God praise. Yes, for what he's done, but more importantly, for who he is. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to share this final terrific Tuesday with you virtually. To all of you who are gathered across our three platforms, who are waiting on a word from the Lord tonight, thank you for connecting with this stream. Some of you are on ProvidenceBC.com, our website. Our provider is BoxCast. Others of you are on YouTube. Providence Baptist Church College Park is our setting there. And still others of you are on Facebook Live tonight. Hit those like and share buttons if you haven't. Turn on your notifications. Others will be letting us know and letting you know how glad they are to be connected with us. To all of you, I say welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. We have had two tremendous worship services leading up to this terrific Tuesday. I want to extend my thanks to our preachers who started out with us, uh, Pastor Darrell Hall of Elizabeth Baptist Conyers and Pastor Terrence Gaddis of the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Stockbridge, Georgia. We were blessed by both of them. And tonight, Pastor Marlon Harris is here of the New Life Baptist Church in Decatur. What a preacher he is. He's a friend uh, to this pastor and to this church family, and I'm grateful that he was able uh, to consent and come to be with us. And we're going to hear from him in just a little while. Again, welcome to you. Again, those of you on ProvidenceBC.com, those of you on YouTube, those of you on Facebook Live, I appreciate your presence so very much tonight. Been a wonderful day today. I pray that you have experienced the blessings and presence of God in your life today. And now as you have come home from whatever your daily responsibility has been, you are sitting down and ready to hear a word from the Lord. And that word is coming tonight. We're going to start off first, though, with music ministry from Charles III. Wherever you are, put your hands together and give God the praise. dismay what heavy time God will take care of you beneath his wings of love Take care of you 
this our last night of revival let's go to God in a word of prayer as we invoke his spirit even now our God our Lord and our Savior we dare not try to invite or invoke your spirit Lord God because we know that you inhabit the praises of your people we know Lord God that everywhere we are you're there Every place we go, you're there. Every place that we've come from, you're there. So, Lord God, we don't invite or invoke your presence. We simply acknowledge the fact that you're here. Thank you, Lord God, for keeping us throughout these few weeks of revival. We know, Lord God, that you have revamped and revived and renewed us even in this season, Lord God. Our request, Lord, is that on this, our final night, that you would put the finishing touches on the things that you have established in our spirit. Whatever you've been depositing in us, Lord God, whatever you've been bestowing upon us, on this our last night of revival, we simply ask, Lord God, that you would bring it to completion. Lord, we believe this because we know that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. So, Lord God, would you bring it to pass even now? We'll be careful to give your name all the praise, glory, and honor that it is due. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you again. I welcome you tonight to this virtual broadcast, this stream of our, our revival service. Uh, we call it Terrific Tuesdays, and on Terrific Tuesdays, in the month of May, we bring great preachers in to share with us. And so we're grateful that you have connected with us virtually tonight. Let me mention just a couple of things to you, please. First of all, we have Bible study coming up tomorrow at 12 noon on Facebook Live. We will be on lesson five of our series called Overcoming Fear. Lesson five of Overcoming Fear. And I invite you to join with us on Facebook Live at 12 noon. Additionally, on Thursday evening, evangelist Inez Clark will be preaching for Associate Minister Night. That will begin at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live, and we look forward to hearing from Evangelist Clark. We have been praying for she and her husband, Brother Joseph Clark, as they have experienced uh, loss in their multiple losses in their families. So please keep her lifted up 
And I do know and believe that God has a great word for us Thursday through Evangelist Inez Clark. Then Saturday, our food bank is open from 10 to 12. We have been serving multiple families, at least 150 families per week, sometimes many more than that. And I appreciate what you contribute each week to help us uh, feed these families and make sure that they do not go hungry. And of course, we've got virtual worship this coming Sunday at um, 9 a.m. That will be on our website, ProvidenceBC.com. It will also be on YouTube, Providence Baptist Church College Park, and on Facebook Live. Our page is Providence Baptist Church College Park. Classes Sunday for our youth at 1015 on our Facebook Youth Christian Education page and for our adults through our website, which connects us to Zoom and allows all of you to participate in our multiple classes each week. Thank you again for giving me some time to make these announcements to you and remind you of them. And also don't forget that we pray corporately uh, by way of phone each Monday at 6 a.m. The number and passcode are uh, available to you through our website. I encourage you to tune us in then and connect with us Monday at 6 a.m. God bless you now. I am delighted to be able to present our preacher for the evening, Pastor Marlon Harris of the New Life Baptist Church of Decatur, Georgia. He's coming to bring us a word, and before he brings us that word, we're going to be blessed with the music ministry of Brother Kevin Bass. And after that, Pastor Marlon Harris will bring us the word of God. Give God the praise wherever you are tonight for Pastor Marlon Harris. And we give God praise for our psalmist, Brother Kevin Bass. I had sickness and I've had pain long. My heart has been broken and my life has been strained. But in spite of everything I've been through, I, I still gotta say thank you. I've been up, yes I have, and I've been down, oh, and my life turned, turned, turned. But I, in spite of everything that I've been through, I, I still gotta say thank you. Thank you, Lord. I gotta say thank you, 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 you. Your blessings, for your blessings, 
like you can and I thank you thank you for loving me for keeping me for guiding me for protecting me thank, thank you yes I do I love you love you I can't help but love you for all that you've done for me again. What a joy it is to be here in the Providence Church one more time to share with this amazing and wonderful revival services as well as to share with my friend Pastor Charles Nesbitt and with this ministry. Those of you that are watching us by Facebook and by YouTube and by the Providence website, I just want to tell you that I'm honored and overjoyed to be a part of this experience with you. I have such great respect and admiration for your pastor, Pastor Charles Nesbitt. God has used him for so many years to minister to this community, to this city, but he's also used him to encourage and enlighten ministers such as myself and others, not just in the city of Atlanta, but even around the country and I'm certain in other parts of the world. Every Sunday, I am particularly blessed because Pastor Nesbitt sends an encouraging word to pastors and I don't even know how large that list is, but with people that he has had the opportunity to impact on a, uh, in his life on a regular basis or a part of that email trail that text message trail and I get those text messages because he's impacted my life and not a Sunday goes by and I want him to know that publicly not a Sunday goes by that I don't read the text and find encouragement in it that helps me stand and preach sometimes in the next hour or so and thank you so much not just for that but for his ministry here at the Providence Church and how he blesses you week after week. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to put in the chat space right now. Just put in the chat space. Thank you, Pastor Nesbitt. Thank you for being my pastor. Thank you for ministering and for loving me and sharing the word of God and encouraging me and uplifting me. Put that in the chat space. Encourage him, if you would, because he's always encouraged you. And all God's people said, amen. I'm so happy to see a friend and brother here, Minister Tyler Green. Uh, God has just uh, anointed this young man. You have someone special as a part of your church family. God has anointed him to preach. And um, if Tyler is here, I don't know why I'm here preaching. Uh, he, he should be doing this revival if he's here. Just a gifted young man with such a bright and a promising future. And it's just a joy to be in your presence as well, sharing the word. We thank God for these musicians. And um, I'm getting used to preaching to an empty building. And I think I'm liking it more than I should. <laughs> and, uh, but I miss my folk and can't wait till we all come back together again. But preaching to an empty building is something that we've all had to grow, uh, grow fond with in this past year as COVID has changed the way that we see and do ministry. So I would solicit your prayers because prayers don't need proximity in order for them to be powerful. Your prayers work even though you're at home and I'm here. Uh, I can still feel your prayers and so I thank you for them. Father, I ask you now that you would send the grace that makes preaching possible, that you will do what only you're able to do. Man, we can study, we can prepare, and we can research, and we can dig, but we cannot transform lives. That is the unique and exclusive responsibility of the Spirit. And so, Lord, I sit down that you may stand up. I decrease so that you might increase. 
You be the maximum tonight. Have your way. Send the perfect teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And may we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen again. Well, I've had the privilege of being blessed by the last uh, several, two couple of Tuesdays as I've watched them and uh, looked at them online in this revival experience. And, and so I know that you've been getting a solid word every Tuesday, and I pray the Lord would speak to your hearts tonight. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 19, is where we're going to spend our time in the Word. Luke chapter number 19. We're going to be looking at an unusual passage to preach for a revival service, and I would, that the Lord would relieve me from this responsibility of preaching this tonight, because it may not be what all of us uh, want to hear, but I believe God's called us to minister this word. Uh, so I want you to turn to Luke chapter 19 and verse 28. Luke chapter 19, verse number 28. This is a lengthy section of the scriptures and I want to read them in our hearing when you found it type an amen and when he had thus spoken he went before ascending up to Jerusalem and it came to pass when he was come near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives he sent two of his disciples and he said go ye into the village over against you into the which at the entering in you shall find a cold tide whereon never a man sat Loose him and bring him here. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, why do you loose him? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and they cast their garments upon the colt. And they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I want to talk tonight about the testimony of the stones. The testimony of the stones. When we read the scriptures, we read the scriptures in forward motion or with a forward hermeneutic. And a forward hermeneutic simply means that we read it with the obvious meaning being the meaning that is extrapolated from the passage. We read it forwardly. We don't read it reverse or backwards. We read it forwardly. And often when you read the scriptures forwardly or when you read it getting the most obvious meaning extrapolated from the text, uh, you certainly are right, but much of the scriptures is written in a behind the scenes context. And to get the best and the most accurate hermeneutic from the scriptures, you need to look at it not just forwardly, but backwardly. Especially when you're looking at the New Testament, you need to back up to the Old Testament to see the gems and truths that are embedded in the Old that become revealed in the new. And then you need to read behind the scenes to get this thing called context. And context is so important and so significant when reading the scriptures because if you read the passage of the Bible out of context, then you are stuck making a pretext of the text 
and not getting the truth of what God is saying in the scriptures. Context is king when you're reading the Bible. And the Bible has within it background context, cultural context, historical context, all of these grammatical context, all of these are relevant when reading the scriptures and it's important for us to bear it out in order to get the richness and the full meaning of an individual passage. This passage, when you read it forwardly, when you read it in its plainest meaning and its most obvious meaning, it is teaching of the triumphant entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And when he comes into Jerusalem, he is riding on a donkey. And as he rides on this donkey, the people that are thronging him, particularly his disciples, not the 12, but the larger 70 disciples, that these are individuals who would have been some followers of his ministry in some capacity or other. And they would have seen his miracles. They would have seen his work close up uh, in a way that the larger crowd may not have been able to witness. And so they begin to praise him and to glorify him and to uh, sing his praises as he is riding into Jerusalem. And they take off their garments, spread their garments in the way as his donkey is riding over them and they cry Hosanna glory to God in the highest and the Pharisees in their jealousy they see the celebration of the disciples and they command Jesus to make them be quiet because of what they are saying they are claiming that he's coming in the spirit of David Hosanna being the king Hosanna being a reference to the kingliness or his royal a royal greeting like we would say hail to the king and this would mean in the Davidic line that he would be the promised and anticipated Messiah and so they make Jesus or they ask Jesus to make the disciples be quiet and Jesus' response to them, all of this we know, all of this is forward, all of this is the clear meaning of the text. Jesus' response to them is, if these hold their peace, then the stones, the stones, the rocks, the stones would be given voice and they would be animated with a voice and speech and they would cry out. And the immediate thought is that he's saying that the stones would cry out in praise. That the stones also would praise him because of the great acts and the great works that he has done. And then that's the close of the pericope, the close of the passage. Now that is exactly what the passage means. But when you investigate the text by looking at the text backwardly and looking at the text behind the scenes, there's so much more weight to what Jesus is saying and what the Pharisees are complaining about that meets us at our at the eye. And I want to dig into this solution and this idea of looking at this text in context. Before we begin doing that, let me share with you what a testimony is. A testimony is a statement about what you have seen or what you have heard. It is to be a witness. It is to be called on the witness stand and called to give a, an account of something you have experienced, something you have been a party to or a witness of. That's a testimony. Many of us, when we think of testimonies in our context, we give our testimonies about our own life. And that's fair. That's fair. But that's not exactly the biblical idea of testimony. Testimony is not uh, so much about your life. Testimony is about what your life has witnessed in the life of another. Not another person, but a testimony against the backdrop of God. It is your story in the backdrop of God's story. That's a testimony. It's, it's not just saying that I went to this school or I graduated from this college or I have this job or I have these many kids or I'm married in this context. That's more your dossier. That's your resume. That's, that's the story of your life. That's the biography. That's not a testimony. A testimony in the Christian context is when you tell the life of your story against the backdrop of God's story. 
It is your story against the backdrop of God's story. And whenever Jesus said that these stones would cry out, he is saying, in essence, these stones have a testimony. Because that is exactly what the disciples were doing when he was riding in on the donkey. They were testifying. They were not testifying about their life, not giving their biography, not telling them their resume. They were testifying about his life. They were telling about how his life had impacted their life, how his life had changed their life, how his life had some weight on their lives. And so they said glory to God because as the Bible says the text says because of the great things they had seen him do they had seen him heal the sick they had seen him open the eyes of the blind they had seen him cause the lame to walk they had seen him walk on water they had seen him do all of these amazing miracles and now when he's riding in in Jerusalem he is riding on the donkey they take a moment to testify which turns out into praise they're praising him by telling the story of his life not theirs but his life against against their life rather against the backdrop of his life and they are praising him and celebrating him the disciples are giving him praise the Pharisees come to him and rightfully they say make your disciples be quiet because if you are not the Messiah, if you are not David's promised son, then you should not receive this kind of praise. And Jesus says, not only should I receive this praise, not only should their testimony be told in truth, he said, but if these were to be quiet, then the stones would have to take their place, meaning that a praise or a testimony must, must, be given even if it has to be given by inanimate objects now let's dig into this a little bit deeper when he said the stones would cry out immediately in the cultural and historical context they would hear him say something that we don't necessarily hear in our American context and in our modern world. The moment he said the stones would cry out, they would, their minds would go back to instances in the old covenant where the stones served as a witness. That the stones actually is the primary way in which the old covenant would give a witness if there were no person to testify of what happened at an event. At some defining moment, at some critical juncture, at some amazing moment in the history of Israel or even the history of the Palestinian Bedouins, they would have the responsibility of marking that moment, somehow telling the story of that experience, somehow relating to others who were not there what transpired in that experience and if nobody was able to give the testimony, they would gather gather some stones and the stones would serve as a legitimate testifier a legitimate witness the stones would serve as a memorial of what has transpired at that particular junction or moment or event the stones would cry out and so this is exactly where their minds would have gone that Jesus is saying the stones would have to be the testimony. The stones would have to serve as the witnesses. Now when you take this notion and this idea of the stones being the witnesses, that hasn't always been a good thing. That hasn't always been good. As a matter of fact, the most notable, one of the most notable ways in which the stones would cry out was mentioned to us in the book of Habakkuk. In the book of Habakkuk, the Bible mentions in the second chapter of Habakkuk 
this long litany of woes that is given. After that famous passage in Habakkuk 4 where it says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, and they that read it can run after that. Then Habakkuk goes into stating the pompous and arrogant and prideful nature of both the Babylonian Empire and the Israeli in the Israeli kingdom. Both of them are arrogant against God. Israelis arrogant against God in their in their idolatry. In in their sin, in their forgetfulness of God's greatness. And Babylon, it is arrogant, period, because of its military strength and military might. And Habakkuk would cry out and he would say in that, that great passage, he would say, their heart is not upright within them. He would say that their heart has been lifted up in pride and haughtiness and God is going to judge both Israel and Babylon. He will judge Israel for Israel's sin against Yahweh, against their God, and he will judge Babylon because Babylon comes down to ransack, besiege, and destroy God's people, and he will judge Babylon for their transgression against his people, and he gives these five classic woes. He says, woe to Babylon and Israel. Woe to the man who is lifted in pride. And woe to the man who covets a violence under himself. And woe to a man who covets or does violence in his house. Woe to the man who puts violence in his city. Woe to the man who gets his neighbor drunk and then uses that drunkenness as an opportunity to exploit his neighbor. Just woe after woe after woe. And one of those woes he mentions and speaks of this, this story of a man caught in violence and brought violence into his house and invited shame into his own house. And he says, and the man with violence in the house, and when no one can testify against him, he said, the stones in the wall begin to cry out and the beam in the timber begins to answer it. That the stones in the house will start speaking to each other and testifying about the violence that have transpired in the house. That when the stones took the witness stand, Habakkuk said that their testimony would not always be great. Their testimony would be a negative testimony. Now, why is this significant in the passage about Jesus? Because an injustice is being done on this triumphant entry. In this triumphant entry, what we see are people praising God and singing Hosanna and glory to God in the highest. What we don't see is the injustice that is being committed. The first injustice that is being committed in the text is people are celebrating him on Thursday. And those same people will either be quiet or they will be actively against him on next week, Friday. In just seven days, they would go from Hosanna in the highest to crucify him. In just seven days, the same people who are lauding him and praising him and crying out how great he is in just seven days later, they're going to be standing at Pilate's courtroom in a court session where Pilate is presiding, asking, whom do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? And these people who are saying, glory to God, are going in seven days. They're going to turn on Jesus. And they're going to say, crucify him. And it only took a week for them to change their heart. That they can cry out to him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. That they can say, praise him on one day, and they can deny him on the other day. Now some have argued that it's not the same people who are crying crucify him on that Friday, on that Friday morning in Pilate's, uh, in Pilate's house. They're not the same ones crying crucify him that were saying Hosanna on Thursday in the triumphant entry a week earlier. But even if it's not the same crowd, then that crowd is quiet on the day when it matters. 
They're praising God on a great day. And it's a great thing to praise God. But they're praising God on a day when it didn't matter. When they're praising him, they're praising him when there is no Pilate, there is no Barabbas, Jesus has not been arrested, there is no Gethsemane, there have been no great drops of blood, uh, the Roman soldiers have not come, faith has not been tested, the troubles have not ari arisen, the trials have not come, the pain, the tribulation, the heartache, the despair, none of that has happened yet. This is a good day, it's a good shiny bright sun shining day and everybody when things are well they're crying out Hosanna when there is no threat they're crying out blessed is the king when there is no trial no trouble no imminent danger in view they're crying out blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord they're praising him and it's good to praise him but they're praising him on a day when it really didn't matter Many of us, many of us, we praise him, and it's good to praise him, but many of us praise him on the wrong day. We praise him on the day when everything goes well, when the bills are due, and the money is there, and the bank account is fat, and the job has given us a promotion and a raise. We praise him when the kids are healthy, and when the spouse and marriage is going well. We praise him whenever things are looking up, when the health in the body is great, when we're in the, the height of our vim and vitality and our youthfulness. We praise him when there is no negative news, no bad news. All is going well. Things are looking up. The sun is shining on the outside and it's easy for us to come lift up our hands and say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's good. I'm not saying you shouldn't praise him. You should praise him when things are going well, when things are going great. But the value of your praise, the weight of your praise, the weight and value of your worship is not seen when things are going well. It's seen when things are falling apart. When the world seems to have stopped. When the bottom drops out, when danger is imminent, when Jesus is on trial, anybody can declare his innocence when he's not been arrested. But can you testify for him when Jesus is on trial? Can you praise him when danger is imminent? The first problem in the text is that they were praising him, but on a day that did not have the same significance as it would seven days later. And the fact that they were silent seven days later invalidates their praise seven days earlier. And the next problem in the text is that they, they take all of their clothes and they string their clothes out in front of the donkey so the donkey could ride and walk on them. This is a common, it's an uncommon gesture of peasants, those who are poor and have no gift to bring to Caesar or to bring to the king or even to bring to a governor who is coming to their particular province or area that the peasants and the poor would take off their cloaks or take off their outer garments and they would lay them in the path as their gift to offer unto their king or unto the potentate or the one who rules over their province it was their way of offering their gifts and so when these when these when these disciples are taking off their cloaks and taking off their outer garments and laying them down it is definitely a sign of great honor and great respect and someone would say pastor what's wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with giving Jesus your cloak your coat your outer garments the problem is that is not what Jesus asked for it's good to give him the outer garments, to give him the degrees, to give him the titles, to give him the positions, to give him those. It's good to give him the money, to give him the tithes and the offerings. It's good to give him the extra time on Sunday, to give him the, the service of your talents and your voice in singing or your gift in preaching. It's good to give him all these extra stuff, these works, these outer garments that we have. It's good. I'm not saying that's not good what I am saying is if you give him your cloak and 
and you do not give him your heart, you have not given him anything at all. And what they did was they gave him their clothes, but they did not give Jesus their heart. They were impressed by him, but they were not impacted by him. They had an impression of him, but their life had not been changed by him. They laid their garments in front of him, but they kept their hearts to themselves. And so many of us have superficial relationship with God. We are so superficial in our relationship with Christ. We give him all of the stuff he didn't ask for. And the one thing he asked for is our heart, our commitment, our love. He asked us for our soul, for our very life. The one thing he asked for, we hold that back and keep it for ourselves. And if you give him all the money in the world, but you do not give him your heart, you have not given him a gift at all. And I know their heart wasn't given to him because <laughs> seven days later, when he needed them to testify, when he needed them to demonstrate their words of praise on his behalf, nobody said anything on his behalf. When, when he needed them to speak up, to show evidence that he had their hearts, they could not show the evidence gone. They did not have the heart of Daniel. When Daniel is in the lion's den, Daniel thought nothing of it to say, I'll pray even if the king tells me not to pray. I'm not impressed by the king and I'm not impressed by my own title. And the prime minister, Daniel, the one who had such great authority in all of Babylon, Daniel prayed when his king told him not to pray. Run the risk of being thrown in a lion's den. Gets in the lion's den and praise in the face of the lion because when your heart has been changed by the master you don't allow edicts and you don't allow the opinions of others you don't allow reputational damage to make you be quiet when it's time to give God glory and to give God honor and to give him praise and they did not have Daniel's heart they had a heart that was flimsy a heart that was fickle a heart that was, that was simplistic in its idea and relationship with God. They only praised him when things were well and not when things were ill. They laid their clothes out in front of him, but they kept their heart. Uh, there's another problem in, in the text. A problem in the text that that's, this is an injustice. It's, it should not be done. You should not, you should not worship a man when things are well. And forget him when things are bad. You, you should not lay your clothes and keep your heart. You should not be okay with royalty riding on a donkey. All right. It should bother you that royalty has to ride on a donkey. This is wealth riding on poverty. This is, this is sovereignty riding on impotence. This is the king riding on something beneath him. It should have bothered them that our king comes and he's riding on a donkey. He's not just riding on a donkey, but he's riding on somebody else's donkey. He isn't even riding on his own donkey. He's riding on a donkey that is borrowed. It doesn't even belong to him. As a matter of fact, whenever a king would come into a province and would get off of his horse, or get off of his chariot and dismount from his chariot and get on a lowly beast of burden. It was a sign of subjugation of that king being subjugated to the king that he was coming to. He was saying, I'm riding without military strength. I'm riding without my flags in and my flags waving, declaring my greatness. I am subjugating myself to your kingdom. It is when a king surrenders, he gets off his horse and gets on a beast of burden and rides into the palace of the opposing king to lay down his arms and give up his kingdom and here you have Jesus riding on a donkey and they did not get bothered by that at all as a matter of fact the Bible prophesies that he would come riding on a donkey 
as being so phenomenally significant that the Bible says, lo, your king comes riding on a donkey. What could this mean? Well, here you have the king before his coronation. You have the king before the culmination of his kingship, before the culmination of his rulership. He is a king who will be crowned not with gold, but with thorns. He is a king who will be elevated not on a throne, but on a cross. And this king comes to say, here I am with, with all the sin of man on me. Though I have done no sin, I've committed committed no sin. I've done no ill. I have all the sin of mankind on me and I am voluntarily I'm getting off of my horse and voluntarily getting on a donkey. That's what he did, isn't it? That's the whole story of the saga of the Messiah, is it not? He left glory. He left heaven. He left the angels praise. He left the glories of the heavens and he dismounted from the throne at the right hand of the Father. God down on the donkey of humanity the donkey of our, of our human existence and he rides into the earth and the earth takes power over him they beat him and mock him and scourge him and nail him to a tree he had the power to stop it but he voluntarily rode the donkey anyhow declaring I'm dying for your sins yeah. is anybody hearing this yeah. here you have the power of Christ, the sovereign Lord, the king of glory, the master of the universe, the word made flesh, the logos of God, riding on a donkey, royalty, sovereignty, riding on poverty and impotence. And nobody weeps. Nobody weeps. What they see is a tragedy. What they see is an injustice. And stone needs to cry out to the beam in the wall and declare that something wrong is happening here. And rather than weep, they sing. Rather than weep, they rejoice. And I'm not saying that there's something wrong with rejoicing. All right. But what I am saying is that sometimes when you come to church, you should feel a weeping in your heart over your sin. Yeah. Every, I get bothered by church services where every Sunday we shout. Every Sunday we run the aisles. Every Sunday we jump the pews. Every Sunday we high five our neighbor. Every Sunday we turn around three times and a blessing comes our way. I get bothered by those kinds of churches because there's something about my relationship with God that is celebratory on one end and it is tragic on the other end. It's a celebration that he saved me and he loved me and he blesses me. It's a tragedy that I still go astray. I still forget his word. I still go out outside of his will. It's a celebration that he has blessed with a new job and a nice house and a fine car. But it's a tragedy that I still battle with my flesh. I still want to do the things he said don't do. I still want to go to the places he said don't go. I still say the things he says don't say. It's a celebration that he has given me these nice accoutrements in life. It's a tragedy that I have the sin that I harbor in my heart against his holiness. That's why when my celebration and my weeping comes together it, worship, it ends up in worship unto God. Worship is thanking him for the good and then praising him for his redemption and his forgiveness and his mercy. You do know what mercy is don't you? Mercy is not getting what you deserve you can't talk about mercy and just dance sometimes you gotta talk about mercy and cry tears down your eyes no one had it not been for Jesus I'd have been dead had it not been for Jesus I would never have survived 
and they see him riding on a donkey. They see him subjugating himself voluntarily to be mocked and whipped and bruised and beaten. And nobody cries. There's a, another injustice in the text. It's wrong. It's, it's not right when you can praise God when things are well. And when danger and things go wrong seven days later, you ain't got nothing to say. That's, that's wrong. It's wrong whenever you can take off your cloak and your clothes and lay it in front of him, but hold on to your heart and don't give him your heart. That's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong when you can watch holiness in the midst of hellishness and not cry and weep. That's wrong. But it's also wrong when you have Jesus on trial. Seven days from now, Jesus is going to be on trial. And what is the nature of his trial? The nature of his trial is this man said that he was the son of God. This man said that he was the Messiah. The question that Pilate asked is not a question of personal fan favorites. He's not asking, are you a Jesus Twitter follower? He's asking a very significant question. Has this man proven in your own life that he is worthy of the statements he has said about himself? Has he proven his worth to be called your king. That's what he's saying. Has he proven his worth to be called your king? Who do you want? Who do you want? Jesus or Barabbas? Has he done what he said he's going to do? Has he proven his value to your life as king? Has he made good on the expectations you have thought he would come up with? That's what Pilate is asking them. When Pilate had him on the cross, remember Pilate put over his head and etched in the nameplate above his head, King of the Jews. Remember that? Remember that? Here's what Pilate said. Pilate said, this is the man that has said he is your king. Do you recognize him as your king? And so many of us, we recognize him as king on Sunday when the preacher is preaching and the choir is singing and the spirit is high. We recognize him as king. But on Monday, when the doctor comes back and gives a negative diagnosis and says there is no cure, many of us become so disappointed with God that we don't recognize him as our king. When the marriage falls, when the money is gone, when the friends are few, when family turn their backs on you, can you still recognize him as your king? In essence, Jesus goes on trial. And when he's on trial in your life and in my life and we have to weigh up the disappointments, the prayers we prayed that he did not say yes to, the things we've asked him that he did not give to us, the needs we brought before him that he has denied us in having, the no's he's given to our prayers that we've made and Jesus is now on trial in our own conscience and in our own soul and in our own hearts he's on trial and the pilots of the world the pilots of our culture the pilots of pop culture and the pilots of our day are saying is this your king will you still serve him will you still love him will you still follow him will you still honor him is this your king many of us stand on that day just seven days earlier, we were shouting and praising his name. But many of us think about what he didn't do and how he didn't deliver 
and how he didn't bring us through what we thought he should bring us through how he did not answer our prayers the way we felt he should have answered our prayers how he did allow our loved one to die in what we thought was the prime of their life how he didn't console us in the midst of our pain and misery when we think about what he didn't do when Pilate asked is this your king when Oprah asked is this your king when gangster rappers ask, is this your king? When the culture asks, is this your king? When racism asks, is this your king? When death by cop asks, is this your king? When COVID-19 asks, is this your king? When a pandemic asks, is this your king? When economic recession asks, is this your king? Many of us have a hard time saying, yes, he is my king. Even though there's a pandemic, he's my king. Even though it looks like it's not going to end, he's my king. Even though the doctor said there's no answer, he's my king. Even though the death came, he's my king. Even though I lost my loved one, he's my king. Even though I don't have the job anymore, he's my king. Even though it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go, yes! Yeah. He is still my king. Yeah. And on that day, on that day, Though the Pharisees didn't know it, the crowd didn't know it, the disciples didn't know it, that they would deny him seven days later. I have to believe that somehow the rocks, somehow the stones would have recognized that, oh, you may praise him now, but seven days is coming. And you'll deny that he is your king. What would make a man deny such a thing? He doesn't understand the nature of the meaning of king. King means he is sovereign. He does what he knows is best. He does what pleases him. He fulfills his purposes. That's what it means to be a king. To be a king means he has full and total control over his kingdom. That's what it means to be a king. And I believe that many of them denied him on that day in Pilate's court because they didn't understand what it meant to be a king. They thought the messiahship of Christ was Jesus doing what they wanted him to do. They felt like the messiahship of Christ was Jesus answering their prayers the way they wanted him to answer. They felt like being messiah is something like being a genie. Rub the bottle three times and he'll pop out and give you your first wish. They didn't understand that the kingship of Christ is not like a Santa Claus experience. That he literally has a will. He literally knows what his decisions are. He literally knows what he wants to accomplish. And no matter how bad we want what we want, his will supersedes our will. When a king comes before you, there's only one thing you can do when the king stands up, and that is you bow down. You bow down to his authority. You bow down to his royalty. You bow down to his sovereignty. You don't get to tell the king how you want it. The king tells you how he wants it, and he is our king. He's not the king just of our country. He's not the king of our house. He's not the king of our community or our neighborhood. Hood. Listen carefully. He is the king of my life. His domain is my life. His area of control is my life. He gets to tell me what things I will have in my life. He determines where I work. He determines how I live. He determines what my purposes are. He determines what my times are. He determines what's, the, what's planned for me. He determines where I go. He determines how I think. He determines the way I live. He determines everything about my life. He's king of my life it's not time for some cute little song and some nice little poem he's king over my life and sometimes the king says no and sometimes the king denies what I think he ought to accept 
Sometimes the king commands me to go where I don't want to go. Sometimes the king determines what I don't want him to determine. But when Pilate stands up and when Pilate asks, is this your king? I want to have enough faith. I want to have enough confidence. I want to have enough trust in God that things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. But yes, I'll take Jesus. I want to have enough trust in him that things didn't happen the way I thought they ought to happen. But yes, I'll take Jesus. You can have Barabbas. You can have the gold and the silver. You can have the job and the money. You can have the position and the title. Just give me Jesus. You you can have all this world can afford but just give me Jesus I don't want to just praise him when things are well but I want to praise him when the bottom drops out I want to praise him when all hell breaks loose I want to praise him when my heart is broken when my mind is confused when my soul is disturbed is there anybody listening to me that knows he's worthy of the glory ah He's worthy of all the praise. He's worthy of all the honor. That's why a rock won't cry out in my place. Because a rock can't testify like I can testify. A rock can't say it like I can say it. I know what he's done. I know the doors he's opened. I know the bridge he brought me across. Is there anybody here that knows he's worthy? He's worthy, he's worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Jesus said, if these hold their peace and don't worry, they will. He said the stones would have to cry out. I'm closing my message and I'm done. There's one thing I forgot to tell you, and that is who are the stones? Peter writes in his letter, Peter says, you are living stones. He says, you are living stones broken off from the great chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. Peter says, you are broken from him and you are lively stones. He said, this is the reason why he called you a royal priesthood and a holy nation. That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The next time something goes wrong. next time your heart is broken give him your heart the next time he forgives you for sin and he rides on that donkey when you know he should be on that horse bow down before him and thank him for his humility and the next time he's on trial in your own conscience and in your own heart when you are fighting with yourself about who is Jesus Declare he is my king and his will is my desire. Right here where you are at home, right at home, right in your living room, right in your bedroom, right in your kitchen, wherever you're watching this, I want you to pause for just a moment and lift up your hands before him. I know it seems silly and I know it seems weird, but right in your home, right in front of that screen, lift up your hand and I want you to thank him for being your king. Thank him for being your savior. Thank him for loving you. Thank him for dying for you. Thank him for giving his life for you. Thank him for controlling your life, for ordering your steps, for managing your affairs. Come on, right in your house, right where you are, give him glory for all that he's done. Things you didn't deserve, things you should not have had. Right where you are, come on and give him the glory and the honor. When the enemy tells you that he is not who you think he is, I want you to tell the enemy, the devil is a liar. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is God. He is God. Father, we thank you. We give you honor and praise.
praise. But there's nobody like you. There's none like you in all the earth. We shall celebrate your name. We shall celebrate who you are. Even if no one else cries out, no rock will ever have to cry out in our place. We will declare the goodness of the Lord. We will magnify the name of the Lord Jesus forever and ever in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen, amen, and amen again. God bless you, Providence. Thank you for this time. What a mighty word we've heard tonight. Wherever you are in your homes, you ought to give God praise for this powerful word, the testimony of the stones. We've been reminded, many of us, that we have been remiss in saying what we should have said about the God we know we worship and serve. And I want to suggest, because there may be some of you who have wrestled with the decision of giving your life to the Lord, that other people, other people have looked back over their lives and seen that in all of that time that they lived disconnected from God, that God was keeping them that God was opening doors for them, that God was providing opportunities for them to come to him. What a shame it is to continue to say nothing, to continue to believe that we are responsible for our own blessings, to continue to suggest to others that it's our network, it's our connections, it's our resources. Think about it a little while. Did you really do all of that? Did you really make all that happen? Did you really make all that possible? Because of what God has done for you and your failure to say anything about it at all, because of the opportunities he's provided, it doesn't mean that the testimony has been eliminated. It just means you ain't saying what you need to say. But apparently, because of what Jesus says about the rocks, somebody is going to testify. Because God must receive the glory. And so if I were you, I wouldn't put this moment off any longer. I would make that connection. I would say, you know what, Lord? It occurs to me that it wasn't me, it was you. I thought it was me. I thought I had it together. I thought... I had connected all the dots. I thought I'd put all the pieces of the puzzle together, but I realized now it was you. You were working in my behalf. You were providing opportunities for me. And so now I want to surrender to you. And I want to take away, I want to take away the need for others to say something by saying it myself. Call us tonight, 404-209-1423. Email us, contact at providencebc.com. We want to hear from you. I promise you we'll respond right away. And it's not about us. It's not about Providence. It's about you connecting with the family of God, the body of Christ, wherever you feel like God is sending you. We'll make that happen. We'll make that connection for you. Because our prayer is that you come to know him as we know him. That you come to know him as uh, your savior, your lord, your master. I heard the word sovereign tonight. It's, it's a great thing to be sovereign. But our God is not only sovereign, he's wise. There have been kings that had sovereignty, but they were knuckleheads. They had the power, just didn't know what to do with it. But our God is not only sovereign, he's the God of all wisdom. He not only can do it, but knows how to do it, when to do it, and why to do it. I would that you would receive him tonight. 
and receive the son that he has given for your sins. For those of you that are already part of the body of Christ and you are looking for a church home, contact us at, as well, 404-209-1423. Email us at contact at providencebc.com. I promise you that we will respond and that we'll get you connected. We are praying for you right now. It may be for you the accepted time of the day of your salvation. What a great word tonight. Our thanks to Pastor Marlon Harris of the New Life Church in Decatur for blessing us on this, our final night of Terrific Tuesdays. What a word. And you can pull that word up again. You don't have to be relegated to trying to remember everything he said tonight when you can pull it up again. And then hear some fresh nuggets that you might have been distracted from hearing while he was presenting it. That's one of the things that has come out of this, even though you know we have always done CDs and DVDs, being on YouTube and Facebook and uh, streaming through our website has provided all of us with opportunities to immediately hear again and again these great messages that these great preachers have brought us. My thanks tonight to Pastor Terrence Gaddis, to Pastor Darrell Hall, and to Pastor Marlon Harris. We give God praise for him tonight, and it is our prayer that he and the New Life Church family would continue to prosper according to the will and the word of God. My thanks to our music staff, our music ministry, uh, to our psalmists tonight, uh, Charles III and Kevin Bass, and to all of our technical people who are in the balcony, uh, ensuring that you are receiving this stream tonight. My thanks to them as well. Don't forget tomorrow, Bible study at noon on Facebook Live, Associate Minister Night Thursday at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live, Food Bank Saturday, virtual worship Sunday at 9 a.m. Would you bow with me for prayer? Father, we thank you for the power of your word and the presence of your spirit. Thank you, God, for the reminder that a testimony must be given. It is our prayer, God, that it be us. So help us not to just say it when things are comfortable for us, but remind us, God, that the most important time to say it is when we are in the throes of the tests that come our way. Remind us, oh God, that's a great time to say something about you because it not only reinforces your presence and promise in our lives, but encourages others who may be experiencing difficulty as well. God, we lift up every need. Pray that it be supplied according to your riches and glory and that your will be done in us as it is in heaven. Go with us, guard us, and keep us tonight, we pray, God. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Go online tonight. Make your revival contributions. If you are not doing it online, mail them in this week or drop them at the drop box at our administrative entrance. I love you. God bless and keep you is my prayer. Good night to you.